Fire Engineering Radio and to our show, Pride and Ownership, the Love for the Job. I'm your host, Chief Rick Lasky. Uh, we, uh, we, we got another great weekend coming up. Uh, we, we've been promoting this and talking about it, and it's a train opportunity that if you're, if you have the time and just, uh, I mean, it's really, really a, a good bang for your buck, um, I, I would do it. Uh, it's, and it's in Fort Worth. Uh, Chief Halton and uh, Fire Engineering have been doing these uh, weekends. We did one up in Chicago that was extremely successful. Um, this one at Fort Worth's lining up with a with a great uh, uh, list of of instructors with some great topics. I mean, you, you can have the the chief from the Dallas Fire Rescue uh, uh, group there, uh, Eddie Burns, going to welcome the group on the first day. This is actually this is October 25th and 26th, it's Saturday Sunday, and I want to get to how you register in a second. But you got Eddie Burns in there who's going to talk. You're going to have uh, Chief Brunacini, retired from the Phoenix Fire Department. Hell, if you don't know who Chief Brunacini is, you, you're I don't know what you've been missing. But anyway, he's going to do Fireground Logic, the Rules of Engagement, which is a good program, great program. Uh, the ta- uh, tactical Decision-Making by Battalion Chief Steve Chikorotis from the Chicago Fire Department. And that's before lunch. And they're going to feed you. They're going to feed you breakfast, lunch. They're going to take care of you. Uh, that afternoon, you're going to have aerial and tower ladder operations with Lieutenant Mike Wilber from the FDNY. And, uh, FDNY. and Mikey is an incredible, first of all, he's a great brother. He's an incredible guy and probably one of the best. Uh, there's a handful of guys that run in this circle of what I call the best and do a truck operations. He's definitely one of them. Um, at the end of each day, they're going to do an unplug, like a kitchen table talk, with all the instructors a day where the, you just open it up and let the, the attendees ask questions and kind of grill them and talk. And get, Actually, we were joking about this. We could probably do the whole day with, with what we end up talking about. It's just, it's just incredible. And then on Sunday the 26th, because that was Saturday the 25th of October, Sunday the 26th, uh, again, you've got breakfast, and then you're going to have a welcome from Chief Rudy Jackson from the Fort Worth Fire Department because you're going to be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Uh, this is actually in Fort Worth um, at the Hilton Garden, uh, uh, the Hilton Inn, uh, the Hilton Hilton Garden Inn, Hilton uh, in Fort Worth there at 815 Main Street. Um, uh, and they've been doing a great job for us where we've been traveling. You're going to have a fire ground responsibility with Battalion Chief John Salka from the FDNY, my best buddy. Um, I'm going to do a little program on getting the rear of the building, the OV, and the, and and just that, just getting the rear of the building. And in the afternoon, you're going to have leading with attitude with Division Chief Eddie Buchanan from the Hanover, Virginia Fire Department. Uh, Eddie, again, president of the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, and doing incredible things with them. And great book with with Penwell, and just another. I mean, and then another unplugged at the end of the day, we're sitting at the kitchen table. So you can register for both days. You can register for just one day. I know Fire Engineering's plan of giving away a free pass to FDIC, which is about uh, anywhere from a seven hundred to a thousand dollar value on each day, on each day. And then there's a um, software group that's giving away, I think, about a forty thousand dollar package of this this tactical software stuff, which is with a couple of departments. Uh, if you want to talk more about it, call uh, Chief Curtis Burt, B I R T, with the Lake Cities, Texas Fire Department, uh, one of our instructors and a. One of the, the the fire engineering family folks, and he could tell you how how great it is and how much he loves it. But this is a great weekend, October 25th and 26th, and at the Hilton in Fort Worth, downtown Fort Worth. Uh, they're going to feed you. They're going to bring in some good instructors, uh, some great instructors. Um, uh, it, it's it's a great deal for you. So we, we'd love to see you there. Um, you know, it, it, before we move on today, I, I got I had the honor of, of kind of bumping around again and, and going up to Kansas City to the Johnson Community. College, County Community College, with another incredible organization, a, a community college that does, first of all, it looked like it's huge. It's one of the biggest ones I've ever seen. Uh, great, great people there, great programs, um, uh, just just awesome folks in that area. Um, you know, I, I went to Buda, Texas, which is about 20 minutes south of the Austin uh, uh, airport in, in Austin. Buda, B- B-U-D-A. And they've been doing this Fireman Fest that, you know, we do a lot of musters in different parts of the country. Professor Glenn's talked about those. And they did this Fireman Fest. They had different headlining bands coming in. They, it was just they had a combat challenge. They had an execution drill. What a huge event. Uh, I, I wish I, I, we didn't have things going on here because I would have taken my family there. It, it's just neat to see all the different things. Uh, Clay Huckabee, the chief down there, the growing department, doing a great job. What an incredible event, Fireman Fest, uh, that they do every year there. And people from all over the country actually come and attend it. Um, huge, huge, huge event. Really cool thing um, and, and something definitely looking into. Um, 
we we brought back one of our one of our favorite folks, one of my best buddies and a brother, uh, Glenn Corbett, Professor Glenn. Uh, Glenn's a professor with John Jay College. He's a, a former assistant chief with the Walbrook, New Jersey uh, Fire Department. Glenn, he's been with Fire Engineering forever. He's the walking code book historian. I always, you know, he always. Uh, no, no, but Glenn, he's absolutely incredible. He's my buddy. Uh, I know some of you before. I've had people write and say we got to get we got to get Professor Glenn back on the show. Um, so, so we did that. We, he, he's going to be back on even more in the future. We got him here today. He's back for you, Glenny. Welcome back, buddy. Thanks, Rick. Good to good to be back on here. Uh, and Glenn, I can't, again, the, the stuff we were doing before on the traditions and the history of the fire service and was just, uh, we, again, that's another thing we could have done for about eight hours. I think you and I have sat around for some time where I was talking about it. No, but <laughs> we, want to, we want to kind of get to where we talk about a few uh, of our, our tragic school fires and some other things. But before we get into all that stuff. Hey, I've got to tell you one thing first. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead buddy. Uh, Buta, Texas, been there. Great little town. How am I surprised? <laughs> well, I worked in Austin. So I was close. I worked in Austin for, for a couple of years before I went to San Antonio. So, But the funny thing, Rick, is um, unbelievably, Rick, you know you know how we both love uh, history of fire, fighting, and, and that kind of stuff. And yeah. Memorabilia. I picked up a couple photographs uh, were called uh, cabinet cards. They're from sort of the turn of the century, basically. Uh uh, they they were the they were the digital like we of course we print out digital pictures now and everything but back then they actually mounted them on cardboard and they're very popular anyway long story short in the little antique shop in Buta Texas probably 15 years ago I picked up a couple photographs of a famous fire of all places in Hoboken New Jersey really you know for yep and they weren't identified but um, seeing where they were taken in the image it was, it was a couple it was a couple German ship uh shipping lines um uh that uh caught on fire at the pier in Hoboken early 1900s and uh, I found these photographs in Buda, Texas. So anyway, you never know what you find, Rick. Oh, uh, you know, and it's funny, Glenny, because if you remember a while back, um I was doing a program and I think it was it was in Maryland. Right. And we're out with the, with the chiefs and, and the guys and the gals from the department and so we were, and I was going on and on about you, bragging about you like I usually do. And, and I, I, you, I think you remember this one. This chief says, well, I've got one that he may not know. Where is the hull, you know, of, of um, the, the Slocum, the Joe Slocum, you know, all this? Where is it? And I went, he goes, he probably doesn't know that. I'm going, just wait. I beeped you. <laughs> and you had it. And it was just, it was perfect. Um, it was absolutely perfect. So, but yeah, and Buda actually, this I, I guess you know from talking to my guys that were born and raised around, I said it's another one of these fast, rapidly growing communities. Yeah, it's very close to Austin. That's why. It's oh, they got uh, the Cabela's down there, the ba- all the big stuff going. But man, Clay's got it going on. He's got some <laughs> great men and women, and and Glenny, this thing was so freaking cool, man. They had, I'm like, I wish I could have grabbed Jamie and Emily and Ricky and and, and headed down there. Right. If we, you know, Emily had softball. If we did, we would have been there. What a great, great thing! Hey, you talked about memorabilia history again. Yeah. When I was up in um, Kansas City, I, I went and visited with the the brothers and uh, training chief over at Overland Park there. Right. And and you what, what, first of all, probably one of the most incredible training centers, Glenny. I don't know if you've been there that I've ever ever walked into. This right. building they got from the the phone people there. It just the, right. the whole facility. Um, they the hallway, Glenny. I, I mean, it's just display case after display case of just memorabilia right. and stuff from there. And it was just like, oh my God, this is this is when you walk into there. You've talked how many times how important it is for our young firefighters to to get into the the, the history of the job before they get into the job. Exactly. You walk into the hallway, Glenny, and you can't. I mean, they, they had one even set for EMS, the old telemetry radios and all the old right. stuff. And it, I mean, it was just. It was so freaking cool. I said, I, I wish I could take every young firefighter, walk them down this hallway. Right. Um, and it, again, that, a very progressive place. They're the ones, Glenn, that do that camp inferno for, right. for young ladies. That there's a there's a, well, there are female officers there put this unbelievable program. A lot like Camp Burn from the Women's Fire Service. Just what a, a, another great group of folks. I mean, right, just definitely. incredible. Hey. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, every year we we have our memorial in Emmitsburg, and they do an incredible. I mean, it's sure. just if you've never been to that, um, sure. uh, you know, um, you know what we do that every year. Right. What What's the message? 
from Glenn Corbett, but from your heart, you know, we, we go to those and we, we cry, we sit there, we remember people, we recognize people, we honor them, right. uh, we pay tribute to them. But okay. um, what should the message come out of any memorial, let alone just the one in Emmitsburg, to the fire service? Well, I mean, from my perspective, um, you know, uh, as you know, we, you know, I, you, know, you and I have both um, been involved with various memorials around the country, and for for a variety of different fires, of course, nine eleven or or uh, particular fires. Um, you know, one of the most important things to me has always been the legacy of those individuals, and um, you know what they encountered. How is it that that they um, met such an unfortunate? Um, ending basically and, and to me it's always finding out what happened you know Rick years ago you and I both know it that um, um, you know if you ever if you were to go look at you know how a particular firefighter died in a particular fire there was always that Monday morning quarterbacking um, uh, you know aura around that particular incident and you always felt you know there was pressure you would feel back from you know if you tried to even talk about it that oh yeah you know that you were you were basically doing bad things by asking about that and you know I think I came to my own real um, resolution on this you know after 9/11 because you know Rick I heard the same things um, after 9/11 you know we, we here in New York you know we talked about what happened and we said you know you know these were these were heroes there's no doubt about it there were there, there were 343 firefighter heroes that day, no, no question about that. But, um, but we still had to ask the question, you know, how is it that that, that many firefighters died, you know? And, um, what, you know, it's, it's important to memorialize people. It's certainly not, not certainly never forget. We, we know that. But I think more, as importantly, or perhaps more importantly, is um, what, did, what did those, you know, how is it that those people um, ended up that way? You know, we got to learn about it. And so... Um, you know, I think we've, and this is, I've written about this a few times, but I think, you know, we've turned a corner after 9-11 because now it's, it is more acceptable uh, to talk about those kind of things and, and to really um, delve into what happened. And to me, that is, to me, even though, you know, you and I have, have again, been involved in all sorts of different physical memorials, I think that perhaps is the best memorial to any one of these individuals is, learning about what happened and, and letting get out to the rest of the fire service and, and really making those points. And, I think and keep, we have keeping it from happening again. Yeah, yeah and that's, like and that's said, the yeah. most important legacy because, cause, you know, you and I know both knew people that were killed in 9-11, um, you know, and I, I can, you know, two particular people to me that I talked to just the week before, Ray Downey and, and Andy Fredericks, neither mm -hmm. one of them I could ever have ever imagined would have said, please, you know, build us a big memorial and, and forget about it, you know, just, just you know, that kind of thing. I can never imagine those two saying that, you know. Um, well, and, and, and the neat part is there are some folks, if you walk into the training center that Andy gave his heart to sure. in his, with his volunteer county and his volunteer department. Of the Rockland. Rockland. Yeah, Rockland. And you see the statue inside, the bronze, right. lifelike statue. Right. Oh, my God. I mean, it will. It will bring a tear to your eye. Right. They're training. People are, like I tell people, Glenn, Andy Fredericks is still teaching my guys how to lead out and how to stretch a line and about nozzles. And right. Billy McGinn still teaches right. us safety and survival. And right. Ray and, and Pete Gancy and, and uh, they're, they're still, right. Dennis Cross is still mentoring me. Right. But at what point, I mean, Glenny, there's some departments that have had line of duty deaths. They don't even have a picture of the guy or gal oh, on the wall. No, that's, and, that's, and that's a tragedy. It's, I mean, it's, Oh, it's criminal. You know, it, it really is because... Um, you know, those guys went to work that day and they didn't come home, you know, and there's, it's important for individual departments, certainly, um, to look into these instances. I mean, you hear about these things, Rick, you know, across the country, um, you know, how sort of like they've almost been rediscovered, you know, this kind of thing where, oh. you know, firefighters were killed perhaps 70, 80 years ago. Uh, there's a handful of firefighters in the department that, that heard something from another person or heard it from another person, and they start delving into it and they find out, all about what happened and, you know, how is that they, again, they, they, they met that final end. So, um, you know, we want to encourage that because, like I said, there is an importance to that legacy within the fire service of, um, of discovering those kind of things and, of course, then, then um, putting that back out to new firefighters that come in and say, look, there's a history before you here. You, you should walk up to that memorial. Right. And it, obviously the memorial, like you said, it, it, it's the thing we need to do. Right. And you should look at that name on the wall 
or, uh, or if you're in Dallas, wherever you're at, when you see some of the statues, some of the things, you, or that picture on the wall, and you should look at it, and you should almost wink at that person's name or their picture and say, right. hey, we're, we're doing what we can, man. We're, you know what I'm saying? We're doing what we can to make sure this doesn't happen again. Right. Because what's amazing is to travel, Glenn, and you see it, you go around, you ask people what happened here, what happened there, and they're like, what? what, what, what? I mean, it's like it never happened. Right. And it's the same stuff happening over and over. And I told you, you know, before we, we do the line of duty uh, death book report drill here, right. where each station gets a fatality, they have to list what happened, the contributing factors, and explain how it's not going to happen here. Right. You're not to, you know, sign blame and go, you know, and, and be nasty. You're supposed to learn from it, right. you know, pay tribute to those people. And, and, and that's and honor so important. Exactly. And that, to, me, that, to me, that's the best legacy for someone who loses their life in a fire you know I mean, that to me that 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 continues their memory and, and at the same time is doing something very very beneficial for the rest of the fire service you know? and while we're talking about glennie let's talk about another frustrating thing the right. fact that i can sit in chiefs meetings and have a chief officer bring up how they do these pias every time if they when they have a mayday or emergency they they go back through it and they put it in this book and they teach all they share with the rest of it which is great right. and then he turns and says you know, they should come up with some way to catalog this stuff nationally. Right. So, and I go, uh, you never heard of the Near Miss program? Right. You never heard of, of Billy Goldfeder's? Yeah, firefightcoastcalls.com. I mean, and the stuff's there. Go to the U.S. Fire Administration site, and you've got the National Fire Data, Data Center. You've got uh, the information's there, and it's free. Right. It's free. You don't have to have a budget to do this stuff. Right. You know, and uh, well, let's move into the next thing. The, you know, the initiatives. Ron Sarnacki is is a great guy, right. um, and and heart heart of gold, and, and uh, with him and his group trying to make a, a big difference in Nassau Fall Firefighters Foundation. Um, I've I've said, Glenny, I, I support them. I support the initiatives. I be, you know, I, I, and I kind of talk out of both sides of my mouth, Glenn, when I say. I've got no problem with one of the initiatives being wearing a seatbelt, and I have no problem if they have an actual award program right. to to get your people to wear a seatbelt. Right. But on the other side, I go, I think it's just absolutely, it's, it's lunacy that you have to have an award to get people to wear their seatbelt. But I understand it. You know what I'm saying? I know I'm on both sides, I, and I, you got to do things like that, but it's right. like, uh, do I give an award out to my guys for showing up sober and not drunk? Right. You know, because it's called a policy. Put your damn seatbelt on. Right. Wear your face piece. Right. But I mean, I it all, all comes down to Rick as who, the company officer. Oh, all the all leadership. All these things. Yeah, down, right? the leadership. And, and I'll, again, I mean, I, obviously it's the individual firefighter, but as far as, you know, making these things happen, it really it rests as many things do with that company officer. Well, and, and please, no one out there read me wrong. I support the, the 16 initiatives. I support what's going on at Ashbow. Trust me, I do. Believe me, if you know me, you know I do. Right. My point is, put your seatbelt on. You know, and, and, you know, how far do we have to go to get people to be safe, to say, look, we, we don't want you dead, we want you alive. Right. Um, you, you know, so, I mean, and, and let me ask you this. How, how far do you think we have to go with the initiatives, with, with, with this whole end of things, you know, whether it's initiatives or just programs or whatever, how do you, what, what, you said the leadership thing, take it a step further, what else do we have to do to, to get people to, to just take their job a little bit more seriously, I guess, volunteer paid it don't matter, I mean, right. I, I don't know if that's kind of open-ended, well, I, I mean. Yeah, and I think, I think what we were just talking about earlier, I mean, plays a big role, I think, um, you know, using, you know, I, I think, like, for some of these issues, I think, you know, bringing in, for example, bringing in people who have been been affected by particular types of problems. You know, I mean, for example, I remember years ago, um, you know, the issue of wearing proper protective clothing and wearing it pro wearing it properly um, is is important, certainly. And and one of the things is, you know, we had several years ago had someone come in who was involved in a flashover, you know, and a firefighter, and talked about his experiences and brought his turnout gear with him, you know to show what actually happened um, during that event. And I think that goes a long way to conveying that message. You know, it's one not as a badge of honor, right? Not look at, look at what I did, but look no, at... No, and look, at what, look how I yeah. could have been dead. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Look, this is what saved me, but it was because I was wearing it properly, and this is what happened, you know? And I used and to think, Glenn, that having a burnt helmet look cool. Right. I, I kind of have a different view now. When I see someone that's got a helmet that's all burnt, you know, right. beyond, you know... Right. Uh, 
I'm kind of like a couple where you think, well, okay, if you're busy enough, especially some of these places that have MMA fires, right. what, what are you doing wrong? I mean, you know, I, I know some guys in the Bronx that fight a lot of fires, and their helmets get beat up pretty good, but they're right. not all burnt to a crisp. No, they don't look like the ones that, um, you know, that you and I know, or, or all the guys are listening to this know about, that um, look like they've been put in an oven for, for you know, for well, Because we don't know what does that. And, and, you no know, one does and, that. And, that's, and, that's, <laughs> and that's disrespectful as far as I'm concerned. You know, well, and, and again, I mean, and it's, and it's, 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 you know, well, I, we all know the reasons for it, why they're doing that. But. And, and Glenn, I, I mean, I'm the guy with the bumper stickers that said, rather be pulling ceiling, and, right. I, and I'm a crash and banger, and, right. and, you know, the helmets are sacred and stuff right. like that. But, but John Norman said it once, you know, when I know when he promoted up and, right. you know, it was new helmet time, new front piece, he goes, hey, the helmet don't make the firefighter. It's the guy you under know? it. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and, and, uh, I, I've seen some pretty incredible, you know, Folks change front pieces, change helmets, and right. it, they didn't have to go out and burn them up right away. It's just, it's just kind of nowadays. I think, and boy, this is it, 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 we. John and I do that program, Glennie called. Um, well, I do one. Why aren't the numbers going down? And he does one. The other flip side, we do a keynote where we both walk out, and I do one where we're actually going to do that fire uh, FDIC right. um, fire engineering deal. Is um, I kind of play the whole. Why aren't the numbers going down? And he, on the other side, goes, well, then why aren't they going? Why aren't they at 250 then? What, we must be doing something right. So he talks about the right. right. I talk about stuff we need to improve. And it, it comes together at the end where, where I, I say, Glenn, yes, you know what? It all comes down to change. And right. in order to affect change, the first step you have to do is it has to start with yourself. And Rick Lasky has to change. I have to wear my face piece more. Right. I have to do things, you know, and, and I haven't been perfect in my career. Right. But if I'm a lead by example, buddy, it's not, it's not by doing I, I want my guys... Glenn, I used to tell my guys, it's it's my job to make sure you go home at the end of your shift or at the end of the call. Right. I, I don't say that anymore. I, won't, I think that's actually short-sighted. I tell them it's my job to make sure you go home at the end of your career. When you decide to retire from being a volunteer firefighter or a paid firefighter, I want you to enjoy life for a while with all your pieces and parts, not die of cancer, right. not end up in a wheelchair with a bad back. And that comes down to, like you said, the whole it's the leadership thing, you know. Um, hey, something really, really big and monumental happened in the fire service uh, or affecting the fire service recently, this whole sprinkler thing. Right. And, and I want to kind of just delve into this a little bit. Let's talk about our the national fire problem. And I know that guy, we could go into a million different directions there. But um, where, where do you see this going with the, with the, with the whole residential one and two uh, dwelling, if you will, uh, sprinkler uh, deal going on? Where, where do you see that well, going, buddy? Obviously, this is, this is a major turning point. Um, you know, and, and really, if we, when we're going to look back at on several years from now, this is going to be a major turning point in um, in history of fire protection in America. I mean, this is we all know where where firefighter uh, firefighter where civilian fire deaths are occurring. They're in one and two family homes, so this is this is targeted at the very core of where our fire problem is in America. And you know, it's certainly this this new change to our international residential code, which is. The international codes are are the code of choice for just about virtually all parts of the country in terms of the building and fire codes. So this this code is going to be you know proliferated amongst all the different jurisdictions across America, um, you know, for adoption now. But this is like I said, this is going to be a major turning point because now we're going to be dealing specifically with uh, a known technology um, and and really targeting it to the bulk of. Uh, you know the American housing stock, which is one and two family dwellings. So this is this is going to be big. Obviously, it's going to take some time for it really to show some effects in terms of driving down our fire deaths. Because, of course, you know there's a, the the larger stock out there is the existing homes, which this of course doesn't apply to. But right. over time, this is this is going to this is going to change the dynamics. I really think of fire fire protection and really to some extent firefighting in America. I mean, this is really going to be um, quite something. And so. Um, you know, of course, we know that this is this was adopted at the at the national level. So um, now it's the work is really going to take place, and the, unfortunately, the battles are going to take place at the local level and state level because this is where the place where the codes are actually adopted by local cities in some jurisdictions, but but in course other other jurisdictions by the states themselves. So this is where the battles are going to happen, and I would just ask that the, that your listeners um, would participate. And this this sort of second uh, wave of um, of pushback from the National Association of Home Builders and other 
entities who do not want to see this adopted at the local level because it comes down to dollars and cents, and there's going to be significant pushback on it. So, Well, it's um, funny because uh, Bobby Halton, our, right. our boss, our editor-in-chief, if you go to Fire Engineering's web uh, site, uh, uh, and, and obviously if you listen to this, more likely you're here already, but um, if you look at the Fire Engineering board blog, the, 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 there's, he does a great job with Battle One, now the war. Right, you know, right, right. right. This which is, is right. you know, it's like the other way around. And he and he talks just about what you're saying because it's going to be hard, Glennie, because um, you've got all the arguments. And I always find it kind of funny that yet people say, "Well, the sprinklers do more damage than than the fire and all we, this." We've and, heard it all, Rick. We've you heard know, it all. And, I mean, um, you know what? I, I mean, I believe in sprinklers. I have them in my own existing home. I put them in. So, um, you know, I just like I said, this is something that. Is is really important, you know? And um, if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna drive those civilian firefighter fatalities down, 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 um, again, the bulk of the fire fatalities in America, this is this is the only way it's really gonna happen at this point. I mean, we've had the proliferation of smoke detectors. Um, you know, there's certainly issues there. Where there's certainly issues of you know the battery issue and making sure that people uh, don't disable them and things like that, but. Um, we've reached a plateau. We've been there for a long time. This is the this this technology will allow us to really you know finish off that that problem basically. And but again, it's going to be this battle is going to be fought, and this entire war is going to be fought at the state and local level. So oh yeah. Um, and we'd encourage the unions to get involved because of course this is a firefighter safety issue as well. I mean, how many firefighters not, are we're not going to put firefighters out of family business. homes in America? Well, you put a sprinkler system in. The, the chances of having a firefighter injury or fatality in that in that building is is also driven to about nil. So well, and, and Glenn, and that brings up another point right. that, that, and I'll 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 weigh into this one yeah. is, you know, for years we've said, you know, we we've talked about, uh, you know, sprinklers are going to put us out of business. You know, fire prevention. You know, the firefighters, right. you know, they don't want to. You know, the fire prevention guys, Dag Nabbit, are, are you know the call client. Well. On the one hand, we get upset when a firefighter dies, like you said, in, in a structural fire or whatever. And on the other hand, we complain when we're doing stuff to make the numbers go down. It's like we've said, Billy, and, and, and you and I have talked before about, you know, they complain about not having good gear. Then we buy the good gear, they don't want to wear it. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's how, you know, you would think that people would say, you know what, I want my firefighters to be bored. Everybody like you know. Everybody likes the the thrill of going to a good job is still there, right? And, and you're gonna. I mean, the, 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 it, well, they're still gonna happen. They're still gonna happen. Um, it's just that you know what. And I, I know, Rick. I got a lot of young guys in my classroom. Okay, they're all either <laughs> just getting into the FDNY or you know, are in for for a little short period of time. They've been in for a little while and stuff. And of course, they want to go to as many runs as possible, you know, and I said, so the day will come when you probably don't want to do that, you know, um, but, you know, when I tell them, I said, look, Rick, I, I, I look, you know, guys, um, you know, we look at it from our perspective of, you know, this is the job we're chosen to do and the whole bit, and uh, we understand that and everything, but you know what, on the other side of the equation, people don't want to have fires, okay, fires are not a good thing, you know, um, and so, you know, if we have an opportunity um, to change that dynamic, we should do it, and we've done it with this with this residential. Uh, well, and, and hopefully we will. We'll we'll carry the baton, and we'll we'll right. we'll and, and it kind of hopefully, Glenny, maybe it'll be one of those like um, you know, and, and you, I think you and I've talked about it on this right. on this show before. Right. The, you know, half the people that uh, were born when you and I are are, are walking around with deviated septums because we were riding on our parents' lap when they slammed on the brakes and we smashed our face into the right. dashboard of the car. Right. Now you don't leave the hospital without a car seat right. with your kid. And right. our little kids are going, Dad, put your right. seatbelt on. Mommy, put your right. seatbelt on. Right. But look how long it's taken us. So hopefully, like you said, this is the first step in something that years from now we're going to be looking back and going, wow, do you remember when this passed? Right. You know, do you remember when this went through? Right. Um, I mean, it's kind of like the whole purging thing you hear about with, Unfortunately, some of the hurricane areas, you know, we're losing a lot of homes, but a lot of homes that aren't built up to now are considered the hurricane codes right. or standards. And, and you know, unfortunately, you lose one here, but then if you build one here, hopefully it's being built to code or built, you know, right. that we're getting better. Somehow we're getting better, right? right. I mean, no, I don't know. 
I, I don't know. But no, uh, we are, and this is like I said. I, I really believe that this is this is going to be just as important in, in fire history as the introduction of the FCBA. You know, um, the introduction of motorized fire apparatus. I mean, this is going to be a major turning point. This this one goes right to the American public too. So this is. This is going to be a big deal, you know. And again, it's not over with because this is just the beginning. This is the this is the fort. This is the shot at Fort Sumter, okay? By the <laughs> by, by the by the core, the core from the Citadel for our friends in Charleston, there, <laughs> young guys, okay. This is the first volley. So um, the war is not over. It just started, and um, we're going to have to fight this because, like I said, we're going to have significant pushback, especially in this. With the economy the way it is right now, this is going to be the biggest argument against this that's going to cost too much. And, of course, our response should be then, well, gee, then take it out of something else, you know. Take it out of the granite can- cap- cabinet tops and things like that, you know. Well, hey, there you go. Exactly. So, well, um, I have, um, I, is one other thing I'd like to just bring up real quickly yeah. before we get into the rest of, uh, the, rest of the show here uh, to make an announcement. Um, sort of go, harken back to what we were talking about a little while ago. Um, we're proud to announce that the, the, the new Christian Regenhardt Center for Emergency Response Studies is now an actual operational component at John Jay, where I teach. Uh, we had the grand um, uh, opening for it uh, a couple weeks ago, right before 9-11. Uh, just for your listeners, to real quickly give you a history on it, um, uh, Christian Regenhardt was one of the 343 killed on 9-11 as a probationary firefighter out of the academy for six weeks. Uh, remains missing to this day um, with his entire company uh, from Red Hook in Brooklyn. Um, his mom and I have worked together with several other people from John Jay, really since 9-11, looking into all these issues in 9-11. She's, for those of you who are listening that were at FDIC several years ago, uh, remember her uh, making a presentation on the main program. Um, she has literally made moved mountains, really, um, on a really? lot of issues, especially with respect to radio communications and things like that, getting them, she was one of the key people getting the 9-11 Commission off the ground, she's the one that was um, really at the heart of getting this National Construction Safety Team Act passed, um, you know, which led to the federal investigation of the World Trade Center and then later the station nightclub fire, so she's a really dynamic person, and, and to make a long story short, she really wanted to have a permanent legacy, as we've talked about earlier, uh, for her son, and what a better way to have a legacy for him, but to create this center, which is to- totally focused on studying large-scale responses, not only by firefighters, but all emergency responders, so police, EMS, emergency management committee, looking at large-scale uh, events and collecting oral histories, um, collecting data, studying the material, and then putting it back out to, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the rest of the emergency response community, the fire service, police, what have you, because... Um, make a, again a really long story short here. Some of your listeners may not be aware of it, but several years ago, after the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, uh-huh. Fire Engineering put an entire issue out um, about the 93 bombing. And about a year after um, it was published, we got a call from the Fire Administration, which is, of course is part of FEMA, uh, asking us if they could use Fire Engineering's magazine that particular issue as their official report um, on the incident. And so to this day, if you go out on the Internet and you look up a technical report, I don't remember the number, but if you look it up, you'll find a TR report from FEMA and the Fire Administration and it says, you know, the basically 1993 uh, bombing, World Trade Center, and in small print it said, from Fire Engineering Magazine. Okay? So that is remarkable to a lot of people, you know, that the federal government was relying on a magazine to provide the their report, basically. So this has been something that's been annoying at us for a while, we felt, you know, we really need to have an academic center or a location uh, in the country that would actually be proactive and go after all these first-person accounts and a, on a large scale, not just to the level what we do with fire engineering, but um, collecting hundreds of accounts of responders to be able to figure out what happened and, then of course, put that back into translatable, um, you know, uh, distill it, put it into, tr- into, into um, reports, symposia, conferences, that kind of thing, um, so that we can um, make improvements for the future. You know, we learned a lot of Katrina, too. I mean, some stuff, by the way, Rick, that was in the Katrina issue that we did in fire engineering appeared nowhere else um, in any of the federal investigations or anything that took place after that, because we, we're going to be focusing on where the asphalt, um, you know, at the asphalt level. We're going to be where the boots hit the ground, basically. And so 
this center uh, is going to play an important role. We were fortunate to get a couple hundred thousand dollars in federal funding. We've got other monies coming in right now. And um, the goal is, like I said, is, is to, to really start with 9-11 because we're sitting on a mountain of information that's never been gone through. Um, to put in an organized manner, but then also prepare for the future. So if we do have a, a you know, uh, either another terrorist attack or a major earthquake on the West Coast or a New Madrid fault or another major fire, what have you, um, that we'll have the capability of putting on a reconnaissance team initially to, to figure out what the issues are and then to build this database of information from the responders themselves. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there because... So where are you at right now with it? Um, well, like I said, uh, if, uh, if you want to contact us now, uh, you could just simply uh, go to the – it's a really simple website right now because we're just getting the money behind building a much more robust uh, website. But you can go to www.christianreganhartcenter.org, um, and you'll see the contact information of Professor Charles Jennings. He's the director's center. I'm the head of the advisory board for it. We've got uh, a variety of people on the advisory board. I've got Larry Collins from, from California on there. He's also a, a contributor to fire engineering. Uh, we've got uh, – uh, um, Mike McAvoy, who's a uh, paramedic from upstate New York, who's also involved with FE, and some other other individuals from different organizations, um, both in New York area as well as across the country. So we're we're building. So that's where we are right now. And uh, hopefully, within the next six months or a year, we'll have that gather that ga data gathering capability that we're going to need for the future. So anyway, so that's where we are right now. No, uh, here's another incredible resource out there. And um, that, that's going to just folks are going to need to take advantage of. If we want to get better, we want to get right. safer, we want to keep people alive, we want to respond. And that's all, what have we, what have we said, preparation. Right. If, we, if we educate and prepare, you know, logistics, all that stuff is how we win. Right. And then, you know, how do we respond and then how do we take care of things afterwards? But right. if we don't prepare for it, if we're not willing to look at it, if we're not willing to train for it, it's just going to happen over and over again. And, and, and you mentioned Katrina. You know, I saw firsthand, Glennie, with, with Hurricane Ike and right. even Gustav. But Hurricane Ike, my, uh, one of my assistant chiefs, Daryl Brown, took a task force from Denton County. We've got an incredible group of folks here, um, like 60-something firefighters with equipment. A lot of people responded. Right. I know that. Right. Uh, you know, we've got a, our, our emergency management coordinator, uh, the chief for the, the county, Jody Gonzalez, heads this thing up. It's great. Daryl. Daryl Brown was the task force leader and went down there. And, and, and even before that, we, were, we moved like 1.5 million people. We evacuated places. Unbelievable. And we had, we had here in Louisville, we're in the Dallas Fourth Metroplex, we had 170 some people. Mm -hmm. Summer Wilhelm, our emergency manager corner, did a great job coordinating our shelter. Right. I mean, we had shelters open up for folks to, to be able to get away from that. And unfortunately, with the presidential race and the economy, it, the devastation down there right now is un, by God, believable. Yep, and I mean, it's, oh, and people don't realize that. That's people don't realize how, like for example, Galveston is just really decimated. Oh, know? it's just it's unbelievable. But yeah. but Glenn, the, the 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 flip side to just a horrific thing is the response right. to it from the nation and right. and from this area was right. incredible because of what we learned from Katrina exactly. and from Rita right. and from all of them before that even, you know. Right. You want to see how to respond to hurricanes, go to Florida. Right. Go, I'm telling you, they got their act together. Right. Palm Beach County, oh, my God, they've got, I mean, the programs prior to, how they take care of the fire, it's just, right. it's incredible. Well, that's but, what we're hoping uh, to be, that resource so that, you know, fire departments, researchers, academics, whoever, want to be able to get direct access to first-person accounts of things that worked and things that didn't work um, will be that resource. So, um, you know, we've got some exciting things going on. Uh, with well, the speaking family. of resources, I saw the website, and I wanted to bring this up real quick, sure. um, the Beverly Hills Supper Club Fire. Yes. And uh, I know there's a deal going on October 18th. Yes. yes. Um, why, why all of a sudden the attention to the, Beverly, to the Beverly Hills Supper Club Fire? I mean, that thing was like a long time ago. Right. And we've, we, I know we talked about, uh, some of the social clubs, some of the you know sure. place of public assembly sure. fires before we had in the show before. Sure. Why all of a sudden the renewed interest, Glennie? And I know you've got a place and a community page uh, revisited, but why all of a sudden now the the the, the, the interest in this fire again? Well, um, uh, yeah, we do have the event coming up uh, about a week and a half or so. Um, um, October 18th. On our, yeah, on October 18th at 9 a.m., we're going to be convening a group, an ad hoc group. So anyone who's listening to this program has any interest in this and can get there um, uh, to Kentucky. All the information's on the website, location, the room number, and everything else at Northern Kentucky University. 
uh, they're welcome. We welcome anyone who wants to come in. And the reason for this, Rick, is that um, several months ago I was contacted um, by a survivor uh, of the Beverly Hills Supper Club. Uh, this is an individual who um, uh, worked as a busboy. He was 18 years old at the time. Um, uh, and, you know, I, and the, the weird thing about it, uh, Rick, is that, you know, having done a lot with 9-11 and stuff, and even yesterday, unbelievably, Rick, I got a, a phone call from a guy who claims to have some kind of code from 30 years ago that predicted 9-11. Oh, geez. Anyway, any, I, I've, I've just gotten all this. This stuff has been going on really since weeks after 9-11. And in any case, I was approached by this, this um, fellow, Dave Brock, from, from Kentucky, and he told me this incredible story about this fire, I mean, his experiences that night. And what was really important was the fact that um, he saw things that night um, and those days preceding that fire, which really, um, really uh, enlightened me and, and really certainly in, in piqued my interest and, and wanted to delve into the future in, in, into more depth. Because for years, you know, I've always, we've all known about this fire, and it's always been, quote, electrical, unquote, and... You know, aluminum wiring was brought up because back then aluminum wiring, of course, was popular. The price of copper had gone up so much that aluminum became uh, the choice of metal for, for electrical uh, wiring, and then we started to have a lot of problems with it. And that, at that time period that we were having fires with it, no doubt about it. But, um, but I was always, you know, when you delve a little bit below the surface, you try to find out that smoking gun, that device, that piece of equipment that failed, you don't find it, okay, very easily. Okay? Uh-huh. It's always it's always about a let you know it's one of these things where you and I Rick have been around the fire service long enough that we know that before NFPA 921 the the guide for fire and explosion investigations existed you know 30 years ago um, you know it was not uncommon to say well if I can't figure it out it must have been electrical you know <laughs> that's how the fire started and it's always been this annoying thing I mean well anyway here comes Dave and he's telling me about this and what was really important was the fact that he had seen and is. Subsequently, he found out that other people had seen men working in that particular room, the zebra room at the club, um, in the days preceding the fire, okay? And to make a really long story short, these men were theoretically not even supposed to be there. They were not hired by the, the uh, owner of the club, um, and they weren't particularly friendly to Dave and the other people actually work there. Um, and they were seen doing certain things that just didn't, didn't make sense to me, and so... This really got me going, and um, so where we are right now is that uh, Dave Brock has done this unbelievable job in the last several years of collecting this information about the club fire. He's gone to every source possible that has has either documentary information, photographs, whatever. Uh, He's got all the testimony. He's got all the um, the witness accounts, eight or 900 witness accounts from that night, whatever it is. Um, he's got all this information, and plus he's gone out to all these different people and called them up and has put together this, this uh, mountain of information, and he's asked us to come in and look at it. And so fire engineering has taken an active role here. We, we created um, one of the group discussion, bo- uh, you know, discussion boards on the community website. Uh, that's connected us to a whole bunch of people. And so, in a, like I said, about a week and a half, we're going to converge on Northern Kentucky University and go through all this information. And the bottom line here is to figure out, can we, in fact, come to the same conclusions, whatever they were? I mean, there were several conclusions drawn, but again, all around this, this being an electrical fire. Can we draw the same conclusions that they did 30 years ago? Um, and if not, should we, in fact, be in a position of, of really um, putting out a formal request for this investigation to be reopened because, Rick, the bottom line really is if this is proven to be uh, not an electrical fire in the sense it was an accidental fire, in fact, it was perhaps an, a fire of intention, uh, an arson fire, uh-huh. then this will become um, the one of the largest mass murders in American history, okay? Wow. That's what this is coming down to because 165 people were killed that night in that club, okay? And if this was an arson fire, just about any other mass murder other than 9-11 in Oklahoma City pale in comparison to this. So um, this is big. You know, this is really big. And we're going to use current um, state-of-the-art standards of practice to study this fire from 30 years ago. So that's what we're going to be doing. And, again, anyone who's interested, go to the website. My email address is on there. If they're interested in coming, please contact me 
and we just like to put you uh, on the list and everything. Again, no, this is pro bono, by the way. None of us are getting any money. I'm driving with a friend of mine from Jersey to Kentucky <laughs> that weekend. So, um, so well, this uh, is just, you know, this is because we have an interest in seeking the truth, and that's what when I talk about the Reagan Heart Center and these kind of things, it's all the same thing. Finding out what really happened, you know, as best as we can ascertain. Saturday, October 18th at 9 a.m. Right. Uh, you, again, again Glennie's email address is, is on the, the site, on the posting. Um, uh, just, you know, I mean, it's just amazing. Here we are, you know, May, May of, of 1977, an incident, and we're, we're talking about it, and we're getting to it, and we're seeing things happening maybe. And, again, you know, you see things now, Glenn, with the DNA. Pe- people are finding out stuff. There's things going on, and we're fi- we're solving the whole right. cold case thing and yep. and all that is just hey, let, let's you know uh, October we've we've talked before about October why October is fire sure. prevention month when every month every month should be fire prevention month sure. and the week of the eighth uh, on or about you know the anniversary right. of Great Chicago Fire October eighth eighteen seventy one and right. the cow didn't do it we know that and sure. all that. <laughs> we know that I tell people ago the cow didn't do nothing. Uh they <laughs> For, formally um uh, formally forgiven by the city of Chicago city yeah. council. <laughs> Mayor Daly exonerated the cow in an open meeting, but uh, <laughs> you're not forgiven, exonerate. Excuse me, that's the right word. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we talked about the fact that we had another fire that same day, right? Uh, and that no yeah. one knows about. Other no one than talks the fire about. Right. Uh, and and Pistigo, I always say that wrong. I think I said that right. Wisconsin, right? With a ton more damage, loss of life, right? Um, Obviously, and not to, no disrespect, not the glamour of the Great Chicago Fire. Obviously, with, with right. the name, right? Um, but 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 bad, right? Um, so we know October. We talk about, and I, and, Glenn, and I use all the stuff you taught me over the years about some of the incidents and the history of the fire service and and where things have come from as to why we do things and why we have the right. codes we do. Right. I explain to our young firefighters when we go and conduct our the fire drills at schools at our schools. There's a reason. Just right. like there's a reason there are the codes for place of public assembly. You just talked about one. Right. All this, this loss of life, um, right. the reason to try, you know, we have different things. I mean, every one of them, and we do this all the time, we tie it back to, right. uh, you know, Ringling Brothers, to the big top, the codes right. there, all the different things that have happened. Right. There were several tragic school fires. Um, right. One close to me, Our Lady of the Angels, that occurred uh, December 5th, uh, 1st, 1958. Right. 92 children, three nuns. Right. Um, By the I, way, just let me just interject right. real quick, Rick. Um, in fire engineering, we're going to be having uh, coming up here for the anniversary. There's going to be a, an article actually about that and everything. So, uh, well, sort of like a retrospect going to today and everything. So, and it, it's it's just one of those things where you know my my younger brother passed when he was nine. He's buried next to um, uh, about 29 of the victims. And, wow. And anytime I've had a teacher that's had a hard time with us doing a fire drill because we're interrupting. Their day, you know, because they've got they've got a ton of things going on, all this stuff and and so on. Um, uh, you know, it's one of those where you know, I've said here, you need to read this book. You know, to sleep with the angels, right? Um, the story that, uh, of a fire is what it's referred to. Right. Um, and if you can read that without crying, you're better than I am. Right. Um, Glenny, you know. Let's talk for a few minutes about maybe this fire and a couple other school fires sure. and the impact they've had on where we're at today with sure. with school safety and why we do we do it means of egress in that, buddy. Sure, sure. I well, mean, Arlie, um, let's, well, which several, one? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead buddy. No, I say there's several different school fires. They've each had sort of a different kind of impact um, depending upon the particulars. I mean, Our Lady of Angels, um, you know, was probably the, the – I would say of all of them, that was probably the most – dynamic school fire in terms of change and stuff like that, because that's really where a lot of the code stuff came from. For example, sill heights, you know, windows um, to make sure that ch- young children can be removed um, from the building much more easily and stuff, because, you know, sill height is a big deal, you know, and if a kid can't get over the sill, um, you know, that's that's a problem. So just simple things like that, but one of the biggest issues, of course, was that, as we all know, and there's still buildings out there, by the way, as you know, Rick, um, a lot of our older cities that still buildings that are 100-year-old schools and stuff, um, open stairwells, transoms above the door, um, these are all big, big issues that um, the codes really tried to address. The problem is is that there are still some schools out there that still have some of these elements in them, you know. Um, well, and, and, you know, and let, me throw, that, let me throw something in real quick. Yeah. You know, our good friend Tom Freeman, the chief right. of Lyle Woodridge in Illinois, right. Right. Uh, on the west side there, 
Tom for years was frustrated. He says, you know, all this money, all this federal and state funding that's right. supposed to go towards means of egress and safety and right. self closures at doors right. doesn't mean wallpaper, doesn't mean paintings, doesn't mean carp. You know, it's supposed to be there for our kids. Right. And unfortunately, I don't, sometimes I don't think that's always happening. Right. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, like we're still a lot of way to go. We just talked about sprinkling one and two family homes, but to tell you the truth, not every school has to be sprinkled either. Even today. Um, that's sort of a common misconception in every school building is sprinkled. It's not, unfortunately, you know, because some of the small, I mean, if you have a mega school in a large city, yes, it's going to be sprinkled, but there are small schools that they don't have sprinklers in. So, um, we haven't gotten that. I mean, there's still ways to go here. You know what I mean? So, oh, yeah. I mean, of course, the pushback on the other side is that they would say, well, we haven't had any other incidents. And, of course, our response is, well, you've been lucky, basically, you know. Well, but... But like I said, there's been a, been a lot of changes. You know, that, like I said, Our Lady of Angels was really a major turning point. I mean, that led to all sorts of things. I mean, it was Operation School Burning uh, that took place right after, not too long after that. Um, there was a bunch of fire tests done in schools and things like that. So I mean, it's like, you know, there was uh, that was really a major turning point. A couple of the others uh, that we should probably bring up, Rick, um, we've talked about before, but uh, certainly close to where you are physically now, New London, Texas. Yes. Um, you know, that was a situation where um, we've talked about this fire earlier, and actually it was an explosion, but um, that was a school uh, in in oil country up there in northeast Texas, I guess we could say, correct? Is that geographic? Uh-huh. Near Tyler, Texas. Um, you know, very rich in, in oil deposits and things. All the oil companies were drilling in that period of time, in the 20s and 30s in that area. There was actually a lot of money coming in. So this was a school in New London, Texas, which actually um, was, you know, you think about, you know, rural American stuff, and you think, you know, of perhaps they don't have the best of this or best of that. This was a school that had a lot of times the best of everything, the best laboratories for the kids. I mean, this is really a, you know, a, a, you know, a very well-constructed building. The problem was, um, was that um, they were using, um, for a variety of purposes, I'm sure heating and what have you, uh, gas right from the oil fields themselves, okay? And um, to this day, they're not sure exactly what happened. Um, again, this is one of those things, just like we're talking about the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire. Um, you know, you get as far as you can, but this is a situation where either someone was working in a crawl space under the building or what have you. There's various interpretations, but the bottom line is that there was a gas leak at the very bottom of the building in this crawl space, and the natural gas accumulated, there was an explosion, and um, it basically wiped out the whole school and everything. So it was just, it was an unbelievable... Um, 325 students and teachers yep. lost their lives. Yeah. Um, it says about, there were 500 students and 40 teachers in the building, approximately 298. So close to around 300 uh, students and teachers were killed. Um, and what, this, what it boiled down to was the fact that there was this gas leak and no one detected it. Okay, inside the building, and that particular incident led to uh, Texas taking really very quick action to require an odorant, mercaptan, in natural gas, and then of course that spread to the rest of the country. So to this day, the reason why we have mercaptan uh, as an odorant in natural gas that so we can detect it at low levels is because of that new New London, Texas school explosion. So it all comes back to that. Well, like we said, every tragedy right. that we've had, I mean, right. it comes back to that. It's just, you know, right. and, and it goes back to what you said earlier. If we're not willing to learn from these things, we're not willing to examine them and, and be honest. And don't don't really, you don't have to hurt anybody if right. you're doing that. Right. You, you need to just, we, we need to figure out and talk about it and, and, and say, right. you know, uh, right enough. What do we have to do to not make this happen again? Right, and then um, I should mention one other school fire too, the Collinwood School Fire, which is now part of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, for those of you who are NFPA members, it was an article, I think it was in their last issue about this particular fire. It's kind of been a forgotten fire. It occurred in 1908, um, killed 172 students. Um, but again, one of the biggest points of that particular fire, which again came up um, in other school fires, was that open stairwell and stuff. So yes. Um, and that's one that, again, for those of you who are listening in some of our older cities, I think you're well aware that there are schools out there that are of that same vintage, okay? They're the same age. And yet, some cases they've made changes and stuff to enclose the stairwells. In some cases, they have not. And this perhaps is another disaster in the waiting, even though we're in 2008. 
um, you know, there's a real possibility that some of these school buildings that are really old out there could have experienced a similar problem, you know. Well, and it, uh, it, 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 you know what, again, you're right. And, and where are we at? Um, how often are you in your schools? I know some people, you know, there's some areas where the state does the inspections and not the, the locals or the state's responsible for enforcing the codes. Right. And But the locals do the, you know, they're not just those pain in the ass um, Right. School drills. They're right. they're not. They're right. they're those are those are children. Those are no different when we talk. We get into the nursing homes, but right. um, I mean, you're talking. At what right. point are, are we really going to learn about you know and and right. take that information and, and make a difference? With and it? especially nowadays, because now, of course, I think we're all aware of school shooting issues and stuff like that, and has, that has turned this whole issue of fire drills and lockdown issues and stuff upside down. Okay. Because our whole whole thing for the last, you know, since these fires we're talking about has been to get the children out quickly, to practice drills and stuff like that. Now we're in a situation where the law enforcement people are coming to us and say, gee, maybe we don't want to do that. Right. You know, during a shooting incident, we don't want kids leaving. We want to essentially secure them in the building. The problem, of course, Rick, is this something we just, I had a conference last week at John Jay on critical incident analysis. And uh, one of the, the real things that concerns me is that, um, you know, the issue of, of shooters going into schools but using fire as their weapon, basically, because, again, there's a lot of school buildings out there which are not sprinklered, um, and what are we going to do when a shooter, instead of trying to um, kill students quickly and stuff, ends up setting off devices and things like that that create either explosions or fires, basically, that can kill just as many students as bullets can, you know? Well, and we used to, I mean, we, and it took us a while to convince right. ours here right. that when you've got something going on, and, and again, we're not giving away any secrets here. Right. This is not like we're talking, right. I mean, you know, we're running pretty much notch. in the public realm at this point. But, you know, you, you, you know, when you have a bomb threat, you don't right. evacuate the school and put them all in the football stands. Right. You know, it, it's just we've got to be smarter. We've got, if you if you haven't, and, and I know you're big, I love, and kind of my comment lately, Glenn, has been, you know, when I talk about, your daily operation, doing a right. roll call, getting you plan your day, and right. you know we got to do those. Oh my goodness, we got to go do those pain in the ass right. pre plans. You know those things that we're, we actually are just asking you if you have time today to go walk into a building right. that you can see, that you can look around, right. good visibility, plan, get to know the layout. Right. Because in case there's a fire there, we want you to be able to be able to get around and come out alive. I mean, right. that's how important pre plans are. Right. They're not a right. pain. Yes. Right. Same thing with these schools. If if you're not out there yet, and right. my bomb and arson chief Terry right. McGrath is already working on this, right. taking the schools, Glenny. We did this before in, in Coeur d'Alene. Kenny Gabriel did a great job. Right. Is taking the schools and pre planning each one more than just there's the utilities. Right. Let, you know, we've we've determined three different staging areas. If we have a hazmat incident, we've had it before. Which you know, depend on when, where are we going to stage? How are we going to route our ambulances in? Right. You know, if we have a God forbid, we have a shooter, we have a device, we have this whatever. Right. Where do we come in? Where do we get all this different stuff? And right. working with your police department. Right. You know, some of these schools have cameras in them that you can pull up, like we do, on the internet and right. see inside right now, real right. time. Um, there's all these advantages, but you don't know that unless you get out and start. Right. You find out that they're there. I mean, get right, get out, and figure out. We all love playing um, soldier. My buddy uh, Jason Fry says you need to play Marine with being a Marine, but we all play like playing military, playing war. Well, you know, the tactics and strategy part of it fascinates some of the most exciting stuff we do. Right. Well, all right, then let's take it a step in that direction. Sit down and pre-plan your schools, pre-plan your places of public assembly, and start thinking. We've got a major mall here too. Right. What happens if we had this? What happens if we had that? You know, get get out there, walk around the schools, look around, and say if we had something bad here, how would we respond to it? Okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, how right? I mean, you know. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, and 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 again, real quick here before we, you know, we're, we're getting close to ending our hour, but I mean, yeah. Again, I always pull things from you just because it's just incredible. But how important do you actually think pre plans are? Do you think we're doing any good with pre plans? Well, so, I, I mean, you know, the pre-plans of the of days of yore were the you know the notebooks on the front right. dashboard, basically. But now we've got so much more capability of doing these things a lot easier and getting a lot better information on them too, and then basically updating them and stuff. But they they are your battle plan. I mean, think about and you've brought up the whole analogy to the military and stuff like that. What 
what military organization goes into a battle without knowing what they're going to be dealing with, right? Oh, and none of them do. Right. Right. I mean, oh. just walking into something blindly, um, you're not going to have the information that you need and stuff, and you're not going to be as efficient. You're certainly not going to be as effective. Um, you know, and so pre plans what it all comes down to. I know it's boring, you know, and, 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 and you know, it does take time to do it and stuff, but it is valuable information. But it nowadays, is what you... Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, just real quickly, nowadays, um, you know, we're looking at these new technologies that are going to allow us to, to really broaden that information out, perhaps to other firefighters. I mean, again, we started with the notebooks on the front dashboard and stuff. Now we've got them on computers. And I think you know we're going to be deal, we're going to be able to integrate in not too distant future um, real time data from buildings that we can overlay with our pre plan. So f when you're responding to a building, not only can you pull up your pre plan, but you'll also be able to get real time data from the building itself. Okay. Well, and that's going, going on right now with right. there's several systems out there. I know one that we've been working with that there's right. net talent right. with the virtual buildings where you can. You can sit right now at your desktop, and you right. can pull it up, and you can see temperatures. You can exactly. see exactly. That's what I'm saying. And we'll be able to put that in the apparatus. So on your yeah. way there, you'll be able to be able to re pull that up, and it won't be just limited to, you know. Again, in the past, it's been limited to the small group of people in a particular firehouse or an area and stuff. Now you'll be able to put this out to the, to, really to the whole department, you know. And so guys that will be responding from perhaps from other locations and aren't familiar with the building. Can get pretty pretty quickly acclimated to it by just bringing up this this, this database. You know? Well, and we've gone so f we've gone so much further, Glenny, like you right. said, than for the books where we drew them out to where right. we've got it where our truck crew going in can pull up the roof. Right. They can pull up the real life picture of the rooftop. Right. And access points and right. see a, 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 a digital photograph actually. Right. right. To see where and then uh, all right, let's park here. Let's do this here. Right. You know, just give, oh my right. God, it can be used for the drill. Roof. I mean, you think about the possibilities here. Using it for, you know, not as during an actual incident, but how you can involve people in drills with it and everything else, you know. Well, and not to, to do yeah. a commercial or net talent. I'm just familiar right. with what they're doing. You know, it's right. the cops are using it right. for the lockdown. I mean, to be able to pull up right now, real life, and right. see, see what's going on in the school, right. listen, the fire thing, you've got all these different colors for different levels with temperature, with CO, right. Elevator with Elevator status, the whole bit. So. Oh, uh, well, how, how, how. You know, what a great thought that is, huh, to be able to see right. all that stuff right, right now. I know it's expensive, but it all right. depends on, to, you know, how much right. of an investment you want to make in your people. Exactly. But exactly. It, and, this is, and this is what, you know, people expect today. You know what I'm saying? I mean, um, you know, unfortunately, 9-11, there was, there was information that was, that was not obtainable. There was information that was obtainable and not, not given to, um, to others, you know, and, and people aren't going to accept that in the future. I mean, it's... You know, Fortune 9-11, you had the command post of the police department was blocks away from the command post of the fire department, you know, and the police department information that wasn't shared with the fire department, um, and it cost lives that day, you know, and, and so this is, not, this is not acceptable anymore, you know, to, to, to do this thing. So it's not, only, it's not only the technology side of it, but the functionality side of it and the, the cultural side of it um, all revolve around this ability of information sharing, and of course, pre-planning is, 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 is the foundation for that. Well, and you you mentioned you 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 said you you said one word when we started the show, right. and it was leadership. Right. And you make you make of it what you want. If you you know it can, you can look at it like, you, know, you can look at it and go oh, this is boring. Right. You know what? Then sit down and and let's start talking tactics and strategy. Right. Tactics and strategy should be interesting to you. Right. And so let's talk. All right, well, guys, we get a job. We get this here. We got approaches. Right. Where are you going to cut you? What are you going to do? Right. Uh, you know, you can make of it what you want. It doesn't have to be boring. Right. It doesn't have to be right. You know, right. It, it, but guys do look at it that way. Glenn, right. you're right. I mean, they look at it and you go, guys, this. You know, it's like fire prevention. Right. You know, <laughs> people. It's like how, you know, you look at that as, oh, geez, cow, my good. If, if maybe. That's where we need to focus more. Right, right. You know, I mean, we're doing all the training. We're teaching people how to react. Right. To the fires and, and the saving our own and get out alive and all the different pros are doing leading out and throwing ladders, which I'm all for. We're doing, we do that all the time. Right. But really, when you look at your department, how much emphasis do you place on fire prevention, public right. education, and and then that's usually where. A fortune lot place to stick the guy with the, the gal with the bad back. Right. The person that just you know whatever or. In some places, like punishment, you're going to work in the bureau for a year. It's right. like, oh, oh my God. Geez. Well, you know, what? what uh, that's the focus we need to change. Right. And, that, and oh, and believe me, I'm the 
I'm the number one guy for that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, we've been visiting with Glenn Corbett, Professor Glenn, uh, John Jay College, and Technical Editor, editor for Fire Engineering, and, and our, our good friend and our buddy, and uh, w- just an incredible wealth of information. And, um, and uh, Glennie, once again, and this is just, I, I've got so many things I always want to talk to you about, and we, we never seem to have enough time. That's why we're going to keep bringing you back if sure. you'll let us. Sure. No, uh, definitely. We'll, we've got a lot to talk about and other historical fires and, um, you know, and uh, we can keep filling up a bunch of programs. And we'll try to keep them as, as interesting as possible, right? Well, absolutely, and you can always, you know, we remind folks, Glenny, all the time, visit the website, visit right. fireengineering.com, and go to the community page, right. jump in there, there's all the different venues, including the traditions and the history of the fire service and everything right. that you established. Your pride and ownership is in there, we've got Traditions yeah. Traditions Group, so there's people, all sorts of stuff, right? People, Glennie, are doing some incredible things out there, too, when it comes to some of the traditions and some of the yeah. ceremonies. I mean, I, it's, it's exciting. We're so when happy you, to see that, by the way. Oh, and it's, it, you know what, how much is cake and coffee? Right. You know, to do some of this stuff, print right. up a few programs. You right. want to stoke that tradition. Right. With the department, you know, that, that great place to start. You know, right. we create a historical committee like we did here. Right. Where they, they catalog and they go back and they, right. they capture all the stuff now. Before it's gone, but uh, buddy, thank you so much. Hey, uh, no if, problem, Rick. Thanks what is that? Well, yeah. One more time. What's your email address, Glenny? If they want to get a hold of you, yeah, they can. They can send it to me at school. I guess probably the easiest one will be uh, G Corbett. So it's G C O R B E T T. Okay, it's G Corbett at J J A Y dot C U N Y CUNY City University of New York. So it's dot C U N Y dot E D U. So one more time, it's G Corbett G C O R B E T T at J J A Y dot cuny c-u-n-y dot edu well, buddy i appreciate it and uh, uh one more point for our listeners out there if you haven't picked up marcus luttrell's book lone survivor uh marcus we had him out as our guest speaker you've heard me talk about him before him uh navy seal uh, uh, uh the, the only surviving member of the worst navy seal disaster in history in afghanistan to, to, uh, to 2005 um you want to talk about uh, the brotherhood the family uh, never leaving a buddy behind, perseverance, and and actually his his kind of motto is never quit. Uh, it's an incredible read and uh, well worth the the few bucks it's going to cost you to to read a great book. But but that wraps things up, Glenn. Thank you so much, buddy. Once again, pal, uh, appreciate you. Love you. Um, can't wait to see you here real soon, um, folks. It, it it's 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 been great. Uh, we've been getting some great information from you again. You can, obviously you can always reach me at Rick at prideandownership.com easy one to, to get to um, send in your information uh, if you have any thoughts, any ideas uh, I know we're going to be doing a, uh, more shows with Glenny in the future on a variety of topics, a lot of historical uh, events, um, I'm going to do one pretty soon on the 5 percenters out there on those that we have to deal with that don't have that love for the job but uh, that's it, we're, 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 we're done we're finished um, uh, have a great uh, few weeks here and as we always end the show uh, with, with, with some very important words, and that's uh, be safe.